seated. Let's pray together. God, what a sweet thing it is to gather together with your people and to sit under your word, to sing your praises, to remember the cross, to encourage one another, to build one another up. And we pray now as we hear from you that you would do your work, that you would do your work by your spirit, supernatural work in our hearts to make us more like your son, to make us less like ourselves, to make us effective as instruments in your hands to proclaim the glorious gospel to a lost and dying world. God, we pray for these things for your glory and for our good and for the expansion of your message of love through your son to the ends of the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're making our way through this letter from Paul to churches at Rome in the first century. And we'll be looking this morning at Romans 12, 17 through 21. I want you to think about the last time that you were mistreated. How did you feel? And what were you tempted to do? It's so natural for us to sin in response to sin, to sin in response to mistreatment. But you need to know this morning that a biblical response, a Christ-like response to mistreatment is one of the most powerful testimonies to the power of the gospel. If you love evangelism, If you love the grace of God that has invaded your life being known and experienced by others, you need to understand the power of a gospel response to mistreatment. In fact, when you and I respond biblically to others' sin, it is the gospel on display. It is the gospel on display when you love in return. It, in fact, marks out a life governed by the love of God a life that has been transformed by grace, a life under the reign of grace. Let's read together our text, Romans 12, beginning in verse 17. God writes through the Apostle Paul, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, this set of directives is designed to help Christians primarily engage with outsiders and to endure mistreatment and harm at the hands of those who don't know Christ. As we walk through these directives, no doubt we will be implicated by these commands, and it will probably have impact even on how we interact with each other in the body of Christ. We're going to be looking this morning at seven directives for responding to mistreatment. And these directives are hard. These commands are difficult. They they require self-emptying. They require us seeking to get out of the way, to remove self-interest and self-protection and self-defense. These commands are also counterintuitive. They go against what seems right. They go against what feels right. They're self-emptying and counterintuitive. They are also countercultural. They go against the grain of what our world believes is right. They are also unnatural. The seven commands given here in this text do not come naturally to us. These are not the things we just respond reactively. We don't just do these things naturally. They are, in fact, impossible. Apart from the grace of God and the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, these are impossible commands to obey. They must be grace-fueled. 
They must be fueled by the grace of God in the life of a believer. They are, in fact, gospel-displaying directives. When we submit ourselves to what God calls us to here, it will put the gospel on display. And these are God-honoring commands. These are things that if done properly, if done well, they are worship. We honor God in these things. And so what we're looking at this morning are seven self-emptying, counterintuitive, countercultural, unnatural, impossible, grace-fueled, gospel-displaying, God-honoring directives for responding to mistreatment. The first one is found in verse 17, and it is simply this, refrain from retribution. Refrain from retribution. Look what Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And there's sort of a doubly emphatic way in the original to say, don't ever do this. This is an absolute prohibition. And paying back evil for evil rendering just desserts or payback seems so justifiable in the moment. You feel justified in harming a person because he harmed me first. In fact, in the moment, you think that it's going to make you happy to pay back evil for evil. I've been mistreated. I'm going to feel a whole lot better about myself and about my relationship to that other person and the world if I return the favor. You think it's going to make you satisfied. But you must know that desire for retribution is a hunger that can never be satisfied, a thirst that can never be quenched. It's easy to see in a child's explanation of bad behavior. Little Johnny, why did you push your brother? What's the response? Well, he pushed me first. It seems so right. Retaliation is appropriate, and retaliation begets escalation. Listen, no kid is ever satisfied by the second push. Okay, yep, I deserve that. You pushed me because I pushed you first. We're square now. Glad that's over. Let's play. No kid ever says that. Retaliation escalates because you always feel hurts received more deeply than you feel hurts given. We just have a high view of ourselves. We feel it more deeply when we're hurt than when we hurt others. And so if we're going to retaliate in kind, you're going to retaliate in keeping with the measure to which you feel harmed. And so it always goes upwards. Now you may have graduated from a preschool shoving match, but you have not graduated from the temptation to retaliate. And we adults are a little bit more sophisticated about this. But you must know that what we see in a child and and what we feel in ourselves at the heart level is the natural response to mistreatment. The writer to Proverbs in Proverbs 17, 13 says, he who returns evil for good, evil will not depart from his house. Right? We understand that principle. Somebody's nice to you and you just decide to be mean. (laughs) Evil won't go away from you. It will stick to you. And I understand that returning evil for good is bad, but when it comes to somebody mistreating me, shouldn't I fight fire with fire? Isn't it right to return in kind? Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.12. When we are reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. Now listen, a commitment to non-retaliation requires self-emptying desire. You've got to get out of the mode of self-preservation, self-defense, me first, my needs are the most important in the world. Look, this is counterintuitive, it is countercultural, it is unnatural and impossible. Such a response must be grace-fueled, and if so, it will display the gospel and honor God. There's a second directive here in this text for responding to mistreatment. It's in the second half of verse 17. Notice with me there. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. That's the rendering of the New American Standard that I'm reading from. The ESV says, give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. I might translate it this way. Give careful attention to doing good before all men. 
Give careful attention to doing good before all men. The word here for giving attention to or respecting is a word that means to prepare, to plan for, and to actually produce what is good. And you are to do this in the presence of a watching world. To do this before all men is to do it in their sight. And this is similar to Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This is the practice of doing obvious good. And in the context of mistreatment, this is especially difficult to do. It also means that obedience to this command has significant impact. When you are being mistreated and you choose instead to do that which is obviously in the sight of all good, that has significant gospel impact. It matters what the world thinks of Christians. Obedience to this command is being viewed by those around us. And the way Christians behave when mistreated is particularly compelling evidence that the gospel changes lives. Listen, you can try to convince people about the gospel by argument, but when your proclamation of the love of God in Jesus Christ is coupled with a life that has been transformed by the gospel, so that when you are mistreated, your ambition is to do good before all men. That's compelling. It's compelling evidence that the Christian's hope is not in this life. That I must work everything out in this life to make everything right and square. It's compelling evidence that we actually believe what the gospel promises. Think about what the writer to the Hebrews says of Old Testament saints in Hebrews 11. They experienced mockings and scourgings, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. Men of whom the world is not worthy. There's God's assessment. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised. They didn't get the fulfillment of the promises of God on this earth. Not yet. A day is coming when they will. But what was remarkable is their hope was beyond the temporal. And this was commendable before the world. It is a response that honored God. It is possible to take the second half of verse 17 in a a different way than what I've just described. Uh, It says, respect what is right in the sight of all men. That could be taken, uh, give careful thought to doing good or or, or to pondering what is right and, and do that in front of everybody. Or it could be taken to mean, give concern for what all men consider to be right. Right? Both of those are grammatically possible. And, and both would be uh, a biblical truth, right? Where we subject our behavior to conventional wisdom so as not to give unnecessary offense. Right? This was Paul's perspective in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 20 and 21, where he said that he took precautions, and specifically he took precautions with money, money that was being collected by churches and then being given uh, to a church in need. He said he took precautions so that no one would discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. For we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You see, it mattered to Paul what outsiders thought of Christians. Having public integrity was important. And this required a certain self-limiting for the benefit of others. Right? And as one pastor has said, this is not suggesting that believers should simply let their behavior be determined by public opinion, but that under God, they should be careful not to offend outsiders unnecessarily. Church's leaders, the elders, the pastors, they're actually required to have a good reputation with those outside the church. And this is true for all believers. 1 Peter 2.12 says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, unbelievers, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. 
And three verses later, for such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And what makes it difficult to give careful consideration to doing what is right in front of other people or thinking carefully about what is considered to be right by all men, either way you take that, often that impulse will not be reciprocated by the world around you. You might be alone in giving careful thought to doing what is good. You might be alone in giving careful thought to what other people think about how you live. It will not be reciprocated. You may have heard of asymmetrical warfare, right? Armies fighting against each other in ways that are different so that one can gain an advantage over another. Now, in a sense, we are waging a war of asymmetrical kindness as Christians. And as we move to verse 18, we're also to wage asymmetrical peace. Look down at the third directive here in verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Be at peace with all men. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the what? Peacemakers. For they shall be called sons of God. You, you bear a likeness to your Savior, to your Maker, when you live as a peace lover, a peace liver, a peace maker. Peace is important to God. Shalom is the word for peace in Hebrew. It became a regular greeting. Shalom came to mean hello and goodbye. Peace, we, we do that. Peace out. Go in peace became a New Testament farewell greeting. You see the phrase grace and peace in the closing salutations or even the opening salutations of the New Testament letters. Romans 5.1 tells us that we have peace with God on the basis of justification. God declares us righteous on the basis of Jesus Christ's work at the cross. We access that by faith alone, and all of a sudden we have peace with God. The implication of that is we were at enmity with God. We were enemies. But God made terms of peace with us. In 1 Thessalonians 5.13, we are commanded to have peace with all Christians. And here, Paul directs us to be at peace with all men. You and I are not to be the cause of conflict. Now, there are two caveats here in this verse. We are to have peace with all men, number one, if it's possible, and number two, as far as it depends upon you. It may not always be possible to have peace, and you may go as far as you can go in making peace, and your opponent just will not have it. But as far as it depends on you, if possible, be at peace with all men. It's not always possible to have peace. You and I cannot compromise on conviction, right? The gospel will give offense. The word of God will give offense. But if you and I ground ourselves on God's word, then we can have confidence that we are not the offense. God's word can be offensive. Your love for people at times may be called judgmental or narrow or bigoted. Pastors are not to make peace with wolves amongst God's precious sheep, right? Somebody wants to come into the church with false teachings and damaging behavior and wreak havoc amongst God's precious people. Pastors are not to make friends with those and be conciliatory. It is, in fact, impossible for Christians to have uninterrupted peace in this world whose ruler is Satan. Paul himself was no stranger to persecution, right? He was the persecutor. He knew what it was like to antagonize the church. And then when God saved him and radically transformed his life, it's hard to imagine someone who was more persecuted than the Apostle Paul for the cause of Christ. He knew what it was like to attempt to be a peacemaker and to not have peace. Paul here is not commending compromise for the sake of peace, peace at all costs. But as far as it depends on you, wherever possible, be at peace with everyone. That's the command. You cannot be a brawler. You cannot honor God and be contentious. You cannot be pleasing to your Savior and be quarrelsome. 
The cause of conflict should not come from me. And so that means we need to labor to not give offense. It means you have to work hard to not take offense. It means you have to have an eagerness inside of you to reconcile. You may have to drop inconsequential disagreements. Things that aren't important, things that aren't eternal, things that aren't convictional, things that aren't biblical. Why argue? Why disagree about such things? You're going to have to forego your own preferences. We've already seen that command in Romans 12. Prefer one another. Outdo one another in preference. Drop your preferences. Be a peacemaker. You cannot be at peace with others and harbor bitterness. It's impossible. That enmity will leak out. It will seep out. You cannot be at peace with others and harbor unforgiveness. You cannot be at peace with others and lack love. You cannot be at peace with others while you envy others. You cannot be at peace with others and harbor jealousy. You cannot be at peace with others and harbor resentment or hold on to silent grievances. You can't be at peace with others while simultaneously hoping that they get what's coming to them. You cannot be at peace with others and withhold kindnesses. You cannot be at peace with others while you have a desire at the heart level to claim your so-called rights. We get into a lot of trouble when we think about rights. What it is that I have a right to, what it is that I think I deserve, what, is, what it is that I think must be protected at all costs. I want to give you a recipe for peacemaking. First of all, when you sin against somebody, when you sin against somebody, how do you go about being a peacemaker? Well, you need to get to the bottom of your sin and you need to investigate your own motives you need to get down to the roots of those sins, the, the roots of pride, where you're at the center and the focus, to me, from me, and through me, or all things to me, be the glory forever, amen. It is the cause of much sin, and you've got to root out that motivation. You have to get down to the bottom of the idols that you worship. We may not carve sticks and stones and bow down to them with senseless mantras, but we sure do worship a lot of things things I'm not willing to let go of out of love for Christ, things I'm willing to sin to get. Reasons for complaint when things don't go my way. You need to sort out what idolatries are there in you at the heart level. And you need to root out what unbelief is being maintained. Right? When we sin, in a very real sense, every time we sin, there is some matter of unbelief at the bottom of it. I'm not believing something that's true about God. I'm not believing something about God's warnings. I'm not believing something about God's promises. At what level am I disbelieving God at his word when I sin? You need to get to the bottom of those things at the heart level, and you need to agree with God about them. That's confession. Confession. Confess before God. You need to work hard at gospel contemplation. If you don't have a copy of the gospel primer or gospel primer, however you'd like to say that, get a copy from the book table and it will help you think through how do I meditate on Jesus' death in my place at the cross to satisfy God's wrath against my sin and have that transform the way you think about sin and embrace the beauty of forgiveness and reconciliation. You need to meditate on these things. And you need to pursue repentance and its fruits. You know that becoming aware of your sin is not the same thing as confessing your sin, right? And confessing your sin is not the same thing as turning from your sin. All of these things must be done. What would repentance look like? Rehearse 2 Corinthians 7 and that list, that description of what godly sorrow produces in the heart of a repentant one. And examine yourself. Work through those things with your Bible open. And when you've done these things, you need to confess to the one you've offended. Look, and if you do that too early, man, somebody's mad at me. I don't like when somebody's mad at me. I need to go make this right. Dude, sorry. Hey, I said sorry. <laughs> That's not peacemaking. 
But if you do a thorough investigation and examination of your own sin at the heart level and the motivations and idolatries and unbelief at the root of it, and then you take those things before God and you lay them underneath the cross and you contemplate what it meant for Jesus to actually bear those things at the cross and remove them as far from you as east is from the west, you will be in a place, a ready place to go to your brother whom you've offended and say, will you please forgive me? Here's what you saw of my sin. It's a lot bigger than you think it is. I'm worse than you think I am. And I've taken this before the Lord and I'm bringing it before you. Brother, will you forgive me? That's what it means to be a peacemaker when you've sinned against your brother. What happens if it's an unbeliever you've sinned against? Do the same thing. Do the same thing. Try it. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to sin against a non-Christian. I hope you have. I, it's not that I hope you sin, but I hope you have the opportunity to confess sin to an unbeliever. The experiences I've had of that have, have been really remarkable. It, it, it's an, an immediate launching point for the gospel from a humble platform. And the response I usually get, you know, somebody's really grumbling and, and muttering about me because I've, I've sinned against them. And, and, and they don't have a lot of categories for that except for just bitterness and retaliation or I don't want to be friends anymore. And so you, you, you go to this unbeliever and, and, and you make this appeal, will you please forgive me? Here's what it really is. And immediately the response is a softening and a, oh, no, 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 you're not that bad. No, 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 you're a great guy. Look, don't worry about it. We're going to let bygones be bygones. We're great. <laughs> uh, backing away from bitterness. And probably in part because an unbeliever is indicted by gospel truth from a repentant platform. <laughs> Right? Because if he's got to hold a grudge before someone who's laying down in front of them in humility and repentance, well, he's got his own sins to deal with. And that's exposing. It's revealing. Let me give you a recipe for peacemaking when someone sins against you. Someone sins against you. How do you go about being a peacemaker? Let me just suggest a couple of categories, and you can write down these verses, 1 Peter 4, 8, Galatians 6, 1, and Matthew 18, 15. 1 Peter 4, 8, Galatians 6, 1, and Matthew 18, 15. When someone sins against you, you, you have options. There's not one answer to this. There are multiple ways to skin a cat. I don't even know why that's an illustration. But there's more than one way to go about peacemaking when someone sins against you. 1 Peter 4.8 is the first one that comes to mind. Love covers a multitude of sins. Just cover it in love. Make 1 Peter, a four, make 1 Peter 4, 8 a verb in your mind. Man, that guy was really unkind to you. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to 1 Peter 4.8 that. <laughs> Just tuck that away. Memorize it. Let it roll off your tongue. Let it be in your heart. Cover it in love. Love covers a multitude of sins. Galatians 6.1 gives another category. Address it in love. We won't take the time to, to turn there and walk through it. But you need to understand that in Galatians 6.1, Paul is not addressing someone who, I caught you in sin. Now I'm gonna let you have it. But you see your brother who's caught in a sin, trapped in a sin, and needs help extricating himself like a, like a friend who's on a hike in the woods and steps in a bear trap, a steel bear trap that snaps on his leg and, and breaks both bones in his lower leg and compound fractures and there's blood everywhere and he's in pain and agony. He's caught in sin, so go help your brother. Put your hands in there and unload that trap. That's what Galatians 6.1 is all about. How do you do that? You do that with self-examination and, and humility and compassion. That's another category for addressing someone else's sin. And of course, Matthew 18.15 says, when your brother sins, go to him privately. 
your brother has offended you, go to him privately. And personally, I think Matthew 18, 15 is not primarily about sins committed against you, but when your brother sins in a more general way where you're not the victim. I want to give you a a recommendation this morning. I, I don't have a command for this. But this is a a recommendation. I want you to consider very carefully if and how you will address someone's sin when you are the victim, when you're the innocent party. Number one, you do not have to. There's no biblical mandate for you to address that sin. But what you cannot do is harbor bitterness, unforgiveness, or resentment. You cannot withhold love or kindness or brotherly affection. If you cover it in love, if you 1 Peter 4, 8, that offense, you must love. You must show kindness. By the way, if you chose to address every sin you saw in others, you would not have time for any other conversations. And just imagine if we all did that. Every time you notice sin in someone else, every time someone sinned against you, you felt it was your obligation to point that out. We'd never do anything else. Addressing someone's sin when you are the offended party, the hurt party, the victim is very treacherous ground for the human heart. The temptations to sin in addressing your brother's sin are lurking around every corner. Seldom do your thoughts remain in the realm of compassion and pity for your brother. They're so easily mixed with vengeance, self-protection, and pride. You see, the ideal motives for addressing someone's sin against me would be the glory of God and and the spiritual benefit of my brother who did the offending. Uh, It would come with a desire for God's blessing for him and an eagerness to rejoice at his repentance and restoration. Not an eagerness that I don't get offended anymore, but an eagerness for his well-being. And so you can't be sorry that there were not graver consequences for his actions. You can't regret that you didn't get more vindication for being wronged. You can't give a praise report at the next prayer meeting. So-and-so sinned against me in these excruciatingly painful ways. And I can give you the details about that later. But praise God, I talked to him about it, and he's really sorry about it now. You can't do that. You can't regret that their lives didn't crash and burn and smolder for a little while just to satisfy my own penchant for just desserts. Let me give you a recipe for peacemaking when you and your opponent have sinned against each other. So you've sinned and your brother has sinned against you. Maybe your brother sinned first and you sinned against him back. How do you make peace in that situation? Own your own sin. Own your own sin. Go back to that recipe number one. Examine your sin. Turn it over. Do the research. Figure out what is driving this sin. Confess it before the Lord. Confess it to your brother. Make plans for repentance. I want to suggest to you that you need to lay down before your opponent Just lay down before him. Look, if you've sinned against your brother, what you need to do is lay down in humility before him. Look, in a boxing match, it's hard to hit somebody who's laying down. It's hard to throw punches at somebody who is repentant and humble and broken over his sin. You want to be that guy. It's often disarming It often is God's means for bringing humility and grace to a tense relationship, a broken relationship. And look, you do this because it's right and you do it because because it honors God. You don't do it as a manipulation tactic. Let me lay down before my brother and really make him feel bad for holding a grudge against me. Then he'll be brokenhearted and then he'll return the favor. Look, you don't do it for those reasons. You just do it because it's right. But the effect is often, as the proverb says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. A humble confession breaks down barriers of hostility. It's a great way to be a peacemaker. 
Let me make this recommendation. Don't try to confess your sin and address your brother's sin in the same conversation. That doesn't go well. Whether or not it's your motivation, it will give the impression to your brother that what you really want was to get him to confess to you. And so you're going to butter the bread a little bit first. You're, you're, you're going to use your confession as a manipulative means to get him to tell you how much he hurt you. That is the way that will be perceived, whether it's your intention or not. And I would suspect that those intentions probably lurk deeper in our hearts than we're ready to admit. Don't engage in self-preservation. And it's tempting. Look, you go to lay down before your brother in confession of your own sin, own your own sin, and I don't care what his response is. Look, if I do that, they're going to walk all over me. If I confess my lack of love and my unkind words, they might just say, thank you. <laughs> what took you so long? I was wondering when you were going to get around to admitting that. They might even bring it up the next time they see you. Remember when you were unkind to me? You said it yourself. You didn't honor God and you didn't love me right. They might hold it against you for as long as you both shall live. So? <laughs> so? <laughs> As far as it depends on you, God says, be at peace with all men. Blessed are the peacemakers. Happy are the peacemakers. The recipients of God's favor are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. Why? Because they reflect their father with a heart of love, a heart of compassion, Listen, our God is one who knows how to take offenses and to love in return. Be like him. This requires self-emptying. It's counterintuitive. It's countercultural. It's unnatural, impossible. It must be grace-fueled, but it will display the gospel and honor God. You may have to trust the Lord with the results of your attempts at peacemaking, when an opponent just simply refuses to reconcile. But the smile of God on our worship of him through obedience is never conditioned by our circumstances. God is pleased when you do what honors him, regardless of the outcome. There's a fourth directive in this passage for responding to mistreatment. It's in verse 19, first half of verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved. And we'll conclude this morning with this one. Do not get justice for yourself. Do not get justice for yourself. The New American Standard translates this as never take revenge. And in our culture, revenge is seen as a virtue. If you did a, uh, a search for movies about revenge, you will get endless lists the 10 greatest movies about revenge of all time, the 50 most popular revenge movies of all time. There are hundreds. <laughs> and if you expand to the world of literature, the, the, the list is nearly endless. Because the protagonist in a story, the, the main character of a movie who does not set right personal wrongs that he's suffered, doesn't make a very good story. Because it does not satisfy the craving of the audience. That's us. It doesn't satisfy our thirst to get justice. And we don't really mean justice in the sense of God setting all things right. God's shalom, right? God's peacemaking. peacemaking. By the way, that, that term for shalom in the Old Testament when used of God was often used of God's making peace on the earth through his judgment. Not just, oh, let everybody go and we'll all sing kumbaya and, you know, make signs and wear 60s hippie bandanas or whatever. That's not God's view of peace. God's view of peace, shalom, comes when he reigns on the earth and makes his enemies bow the knee. That day's coming. 
And so a desire for justice, a desire for revenge in these movies and stories in our culture is not grounded in God's shalom, God's justice, but it's grounded in personal vengeance. And it's ugly. And those movies never satisfy the craving in each of our hearts to get that kind of justice. The, the perfect standard of God's righteousness is not what we desire. In fact, we dare not want that as long as we're sinners. Right? Be careful what you cry for if you cry for absolute justice. None of us should desire what we deserve. You may know the names of two families, the Hatfields and the McCoys. Between 1880 and 1891, a feud erupted between these two families perched on either side of the big Sandy River. It separated what would eventually become West Virginia and Kentucky. And the feud grew so fierce that militia from both of those states were called in to intervene and put a stop to the fighting. The rivalry between the McCoy and the Hatfield families has become a modern parable on personal vengeance. The feud purportedly began when Asa Harmon McCoy was killed for fighting on the wrong side of the Civil War. One life was exchanged for another. Vengeance was taken. McCoys were killed for Hatfields. Hatfields were killed for McCoys. At one point, a fatal fight erupted over the possession of a pig. Whose pig is it? Apparently, the, the McCoys' branded pig marched itself onto the Hatfield property. It's on our land. It's our pig. It's got our marking. It's our pig. Gunshots. Dead people. Retaliation. Escalation. It did not end well. A dozen people were killed in cold blood. At least 10 were injured severely. Generations later, that story does have a happy ending. In 1979, the descendants of the Hatfields and McCoys hashed out their differences on the television game show Family Feud. A McCoy victory settled the long score. The spoils, by the way, were cash prizes, and you guessed it, a pig. <laughs> what would life be like if the duty of meeting out vengeance was our personal responsibility? What would the world be like if justice was in our hands, if the vindication of wrong was left up to every individual? In William Golding's novel, Lord of the Flies, a bunch of shipwrecked school kids wash up on an island. Stranded and fending for themselves, they create their own society. Before long, jealousy over a seashell turns to rage, to murder, to vengeance. It's awful to contemplate what would life be like, like that on a global scale. What if the Hatfield-McCoy feud spread to every family? Bloodshed, retaliation, re-retaliation, anarchy. And I checked with John McCoy, who's seated with us this morning. He is not a direct descendant. <laughs> so if you're a Hatfield in here in this room this morning, you have nothing to worry about. John also told me that he read that the descendants of the McCoys and the Hatfields who loved Christ came together to express peace, the peace that the gospel makes between warring parties. Our text here in Romans 12 says, literally, do not for yourself get justice. And the verb means to produce justice for someone. But when connected with this reflexive pronoun, for yourself, the idea means to take revenge. And this idea is more severe than what we looked at in verse 17, just returning evil for evil. Retaliation. It's not just that you want to harm someone because he harmed you, but you want to demand justice for crimes committed. You want to exact the penalty due for the transgress transgression made. Vengeance is trying to get justice for yourself. You become the judge, the jury, the executioner. You will carry out the sentence. Even desiring that someone else carry out the sentence hoping that some institution will take up your cause, some government agency, some court of law. Listen, if that desire in you springs from a heart of revenge, it is a violation of this directive. In a few weeks, we'll be looking at Romans 13 and the place that the civil government has to take personal vengeance out of the lives of us individuals and put it in the realm of the government. It's appropriate for human governments to punish evildoers and to aim at justice. But listen, if your heart is craving that the government will bear the sword against your opponent, 
because revenge is in your heart, you violated this command. It's a good thing to long for real justice. But when I'm the offended party, it's really hard to love justice without also wanting a pound of flesh for my own personal satisfaction. We're so easily prone to pretty up our vengeful attitudes by calling them justice, right? That's a virtuous word, a biblical word, a good word. But we whitewash our sins and our wrong attitudes with that label. And, and so much sin crawls around on this battlefield, camouflaged in biblical language. Now, you might not find yourself this morning in a retributive face-slapping contest, <laughs> but there are more subtle forms of vengeance that we tend to entertain. Sometimes those subtle forms uh, take the fashion of understated grievances. Psychology labels this behavior as passive-aggressive. Right? We have our plausibly deniable jabs. I, I want to get in my little jab at you, but I want to be able to say that I wasn't really jabbing. I want to be able to express how upset I am without actually being accountable for it. As someone who avoids direct confrontation, someone who wants to flirt with criticism without being quite clear, that way if someone suspects that I'm being unkind, I can dismiss it. I can say, you just didn't understand what I was saying. We use backhanded compliments that way. Sarcasm and biting humor are used to eke out revenge from our ugly hearts in the lives of others. Maybe you mutter under your breath as you turn your back and walk away. You ever know somebody that says, you're welcome, when you forget to say thank you? What are they doing? They, they've taken a personal offense that you didn't express gratitude and instead of saying, brother, I've noticed a pattern in your life of not expressing gratitude, they do want to eke out vengeance right there with a biting remark. Or maybe you get the silent treatment. We exact vengeance through pent-up bitterness without clear communication. I know it would be wrong or it might seem unkind to others if I clearly communicated my grievance. So I don't want to do that. But I still feel unjustly treated and those feelings will come out in these subtle unkindnesses I do not want to put to death. And these are all expressions of a heart committed to vengeance. Why can't we take justice into our own hands? Why is it wrong for us to not seek this kind of Payback. Now, the answers are really pretty obvious when we just stop to thoughtfully ask that question. You and I do not judge correctly. Do you realize that you have never actually interpreted anything with 100% accuracy? We're not omniscient. We misunderstand others' motives. We misjudge the intentions of our own hearts. Only God can see these things. You and I have limited information. We're blinded by our impulses and our lusts. We're predisposed to promote self at the expense of others. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt while we assume the worst possible motives in other people. And as evildoers ourselves, we really do not have a good grasp on what is good and what is evil by God's definitions. Our definitions of evil and good are skewed. Even in our redeemed state, we cannot shake the vestiges of our fleshly thinking. We're not naturally given to thinking God's thoughts after him. We don't see rightly as he sees. You and I are simply not qualified to mete out justice. Even if we could assess a situation properly, we do not have the authority nor the power to recompense evil. Even if we were impartial judges, we could not exact the recompense required for all parties to be made whole. We cannot create shalom because we cannot dispense the judgment that shalom requires. Only God can do that. George Lawson writes, to say that we will recompense evil is the same as saying that we will step into the throne of God, wrest his thunderbolts out of his hands, and hurl them against all that we judge to be our enemies. You don't want to do that. How important... In Romans 12 is this word, beloved. 
Verse 19, never take your own revenge, beloved. What a helpful reminder, Christian. You are loved by God. You were loved while you were an enemy. You have been loved. You are loved. You will forever be loved by God. Remember that Romans 1 to 11, the explanation of the good news of the gospel is the fuel for Christian living here in Romans 12, 19a. Don't take revenge, beloved. Why? Because the, the Soyuz rocket, right? The football field high two-stage rocket weighing 280 tons, 90% of it which is fuel that puts the, the payload into orbit. Romans 1 to 11 is that rocket fuel that puts the payload of Christian living into orbit. It is what fuels our obedience. Gospel fuel for our obedience to this challenging command is wrapped up in this little word, beloved. You are loved. You have been loved by God and at infinite cost. This reminder is so helpful. The gospel is the only thing that can produce in us this self-emptying, counterintuitive, countercultural, unnatural, impossible, grace-fueled, gospel-displaying, God-honoring response to mistreatment. Let's pray. God, thank you for these words this morning. These directives so unnatural to the way we were born, so unnatural to the ways that we lived apart from your grace, but now under the reign of grace, possible, actual. And we pray to excel still more in our selfless love for others because you have loved us and you have loved us with the kind of love that showed kindness when we made ourselves your enemies. God, we pray that this body of believers living this way will be vehicles fit for use to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. For your glory in Jesus' name, amen.